Former Penguin and two-time Stanley Cup champion Nick Bonino is now a New York Ranger. We've got Hunter Hodes from Locked On Pittsburgh Penguins on the show here today for a special crossover episode. Going to talk about Bonino as well as the off-seasons for the Rangers and Penguins as a whole. All this and much, much more on today's episode of Locked On New York Rangers and Locked On Pittsburgh Penguins. You're Locked On the New York Rangers, your daily podcast on the New York Rangers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, welcome back Rangers fans and Penguins fans. Like I said, we got a very special crossover edition here today. This is John Chick with Locked On New York Rangers, joined here by my good friend Hunter Hodes of Locked On Pittsburgh Penguins for once again a uh, very fun-filled crossover edition here. And uh, Hunter, we might as well just uh, jump right into it here. Obviously, Nick Bonino, now 35 years old, and he went back to the Penguins for the second time this past season, only played three games there. Uh, when he really made his mark with your team, though, was obviously uh, the, the two Stanley Cups that they won while he was there. And, you know, for Bonino, somebody that obviously is not, you know, known as a superstar player or anything along those lines, but has a reputation just being a gritty, hardworking, tone-setting kind of player, good defensive forward, penalty killing, the whole nine yards. I mean, does that sound about right? Did it, is that basically Bonino in a nutshell? Would you go along with that assessment there? Definitely at this point in his career, John. I remember I was decently excited when they got him for a second time at the trade deadline. I was like, oh, well, more help for the bottom six, especially defensively. But then he only plays three games, gets hurt, and then misses the rest of the season. Very unfortunate with the injury that he had, but he can still play really well in the defensive zone. This past season, ranked in the 84th percentile for five-on-five five defensive impact. Overall, defensively, ranked in the 93rd percentile for five-on-five five defense and can also kill you penalties. Ranks in the 82nd percentile for county penalty kill for bottom six forward. So if you need him to kill penalties, if you need him to go out there in a big-time situation to close down a lead, I think he can definitely do that. He's not going to give the Rangers too much offense. He's just not that kind of player anymore where he's going to give you 15 to 17, 18 goals a season. But I think he'll still give you maybe 8 to 10, maybe upwards of 11 to 12 goals a year at this point. He's just, you know, he's in his mid-30s now. He's not the same player that he was back when he was with the Penguins in 2016, 2017, when he could score you a good amount of goals. He can still be a little bit clutch for the Rangers in the playoffs. And maybe we'll get to that a little later on. He's always been a pretty clutch player throughout his career, but overall, especially during the regular season for all 82 games, you're really going to get a good shutdown defensive player who can kill penalties. He can sk still skate decently well, but not going to give you a lot of offense, at least right now. Yeah. I mean, that, that sounds about right. That's kind of the player that I was kind of envisioning for the Rangers. Somebody that can just kind of center the fourth line, you know, go out there and work hard and, uh, potentially still be a tone setting player and somebody that can kill some penalties and, you know, do a, a lot of the little things to help you win. Um, you know, Hunter, you mentioned a second ago, you were excited when the Penguins brought him back via a trade this past season. And then of course, once again, um, you know, it doesn't really work out. I mean, he got hurt. There's nothing you can really do about it, but he only played three games for the Penguins. Uh, when the season ended, did you think the Penguins could bring him back, should bring him back? Did you personally want to see him back just just any thoughts on uh Bonino and potentially him sticking around longer uh than just the three games this past season it's funny I didn't really expect any of their pending unrestricted free agents to come back and then they signed Tristan Jari when Kyle Dubas took over funny enough on July 1 about a month ago but I never really had a feeling that Benino was going to come back, only played a few games. Kyle Dubas really has no history with Benino. He was not the one that acquired him at the trade deadline. That was Ron Hextall and Brian Burke. And for a player who really doesn't bring that much offense, I just don't think it makes any sense for the Penguins at this point, though. It is funny because the players that they, they, they did bring in to their bottom six, like a Matt Nieto, a Nola Chari, a Lars Eller, they're all three very good defensive players. So he would have fit the bill there, right? But due to his age, due to him not being maybe as good as some of those other three players in the defensive zone, he's still pretty good, but I think there are other, the other players, their numbers are a little bit better. I just don't really think it made that much sense to bring him back. It would have just it was really just crowded the forward group even more. I'm more comfortable with the players that they brought in to the fold especially defensively, than Nick Benito. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and I wanted to mention this as well, because, you know, I just did a crossover episode with the guys from Locked On Senators, and we were talking about, among other things, Vladimir Tarasenko leaving the Rangers, uh, heading to Ottawa. And, you know, I, I never really thought that Tarasenko would be anything more 
uh, than a rental for the Rangers. They just don't have the cap space to be able to afford him. Uh, but then there were all these rumors that Tarasenko was going to be going to the Canes. Felt like they were maybe the uh, the front runner there. They end up going to the he ends up going to the Senators instead. And that was kind of a relief for me because, well, you know what? At least he's not on a rival team in the Metro. I realize Nick Bonino is not Vladimir Tarasenko. I get that. But from your perspective, I mean, is there any, like, trepidation about, oh, man, th this guy's on the Rangers now? Like, it, could he hurt them in any meaningful way? Or um, it, does it just bother you personally to see somebody that won cups with the, the Penguins now uh, going to the rival Rangers? It may feel a little weird at first, but unless he scores a game-winning goal against them during the regular season, or, you know, if they these two teams play again in the playoffs, and God forbid if that happens with how the rivalry is right now between oh, these God. two teams, how, with how crazy yeah. that last series was, I don't think it's going to make me lose sleep at night. Now, if the Rangers sign someone like a Jason Zucker, who just had a career year for the Penguins, I would have definitely been a little bit more worried. He's in Arizona right now. I think he's going to be some trade bait for them. He can potentially go to a, a contender at the trade deadline. But in terms of Benino, again, unless he scores a game-winning goal in a high stake situation or just saves a goal on the goal line, I'm not really going to be, you know, again, too upset about it. He obviously was a great player with the Penguins for a few years, helped them win two Stanley Cups. But, hey, players have to go to rivals of teams – that they win with sometimes. That's just how it is. And on a one-year deal worth not even a million dollars, I think that's a pretty good bet for him. And I'm curious to see how he does. But no, I'm not really going to get too upset about it. That's for sure. Yeah, that makes sense. And it's it's funny you mentioned that because, yeah, I mean, very few players stick with the same team through their entire career. And a lot of times they'll end up on a rival team. Um, and we're going to talk about the HBK line momentarily here. But I think for me and, and maybe for some other Ranger fans as well, the small little silver lining to watching the Penguins win back-to-back -back cups not too long ago was, well, at least Carl Hagelin got a Stanley Cup or two there. So that that, that was kind of nice. You know, we, he is a pretty popular player when he was here and uh, late round draft pick and ended up having uh, quite a nice career for himself. And um, we'll, we'll see what the future holds for him. Obviously, he's had the eye injury. So uh, all the best to Carl Hagelin. But um, one other thing I want to ask you about as it pertains to Bonino here. Um, so like just personality-wise, and again, we're, we're talking more the first run as opposed to this past season where he only played three games with the Penguins. But just like, how does he go about his business? Is he like a rah-rah guy or uh, is he all business? Does he joke around a little bit? Just kind of give us a feel for, you know, who he is and what kind of personality he brings to the rink. He's definitely, I think, a good mix. You know, he's definitely serious at times, but he'll also joke around in the locker room. There were numerous videos that have been posted on social media, either from beat reporters or from just the team's social media pages where he just joking around in the locker room with his fellow players, whether it was Cindy Crosby, Evgeny Malkin, Chris Tang, Patrick Hornquist, Phil Kessel, Carl Haglin, Ian Cole, the list goes on and on. But he was also a underrated leader, I thought, for the Penguins during those years. Obviously, you have the, the core leadership group. Cindy Crosby, Evgeny Malkin, Chris Tang, Marc-Andre Fleury was there at the time. Patrick Hornquist was in kind of like in that next in line for leaders. Ian Cole was there at the time, too, before he moved on to play for other teams. But Benino was right there with them. And when something needed to be said, when the core players didn't want to do it, Benino was there to do it. So he can be a good voice for the locker room. He can also joke around. Again, he's not a locker room cancer. That's for sure. He is definitely someone that you would want to have in your locker room, especially when it comes to maybe helping out some younger players. I think that could be also a big underrated um, aspect for him, for the Rangers as well. I think so too. You know, one of those guys that just kind of has the respect of uh, all his peers around the league. And, you know, he will certainly be one of the veterans on this Ranger team that, you know, has gotten a little bit older. You know, people look at the median age and all oh, the Rangers, they got old. It's like, well, not really. I mean, the old guys are all there for like one year. It's like Bonino and Blake Wheeler and Jonathan Quick. That pulls the average age up quite a bit there. But it, it is good to know that, um, you know, he can come in and, um, you know, obviously they're not going to make him the captain or anything like that. But uh, just to kind of be that elder statesman and somebody uh, obviously who's done some winning and played in a lot of playoff games. You know, I, I think it's for what the price was. It's a solid addition uh, for the Rangers. And uh, Hunter, I definitely want to ask you about the HBK line, which obviously uh, Bonino was a part of for uh, the two most recent Stanley Cup championship runs for the Penguins and uh, some other things as well. You know, just how he how his skill set translates to the playoffs. And we'll get to that in just a second. But first, uh, we do have to let everybody know. Today's episode of Locked on New York Rangers and Locked on Pittsburgh Penguins is brought to you by FanDuel. Take your first swing at betting MLB on FanDuel and get 10 times your first bet amount in bonus bets up to $200. That's right. 
Just bet 20 bucks and you'll land $200 in bonus bets, win or lose. That's 200. You can spend betting everything from the money line to the over under to who you think will hit the first home run. All on an app that is safe, secure, and super easy to use. Plus, when you win, you can get paid instantly. There's no better place to bet on MLB than FanDuel, America's number one sports book. So sign up today, visit fanduel.com slash locked on to get up to $200 back in bonus bets. That's fanduel.com slash locked on. FanDuel, official partner of Major League Baseball. All right, and so uh, Hunter and I would just like to thank everybody for making Locked On Rangers and Locked On Penguins your first listen every day. Both shows free and available on all platforms, including YouTube. And uh, Hunter, to just kind of go into the the time machine here, back into, uh, I guess, the mid-2010s or whatever we want to call it. Uh, The Penguins, you know, they win the two Stanley Cups there back-to-back. And uh, one of the driving forces for both of those runs, I think especially the first one, but you can uh, elaborate on this more, Um, but it was the HBK line, the third line for the Penguins. Uh, It was Carl Hagelin, uh, Nick Bonino, and Phil Kessel, two out of three of whom have now played for the New York Rangers or are about to play for the New York Ranger. But, um, yeah, just talk a little bit about what that line brought to the table and uh, how important were they in those runs for the Penguins and specifically Bonino, if you could. It was the biggest X factor for the Penguins in both 2016 2017, especially 2016, though. You had the Crosby line in 2016, which was blitzing opponents. You had the Evgeny Malkin line, which was also really good. But when Mike Sullivan needed another line to really provide offense, he would send out that third line. And Carl Hagelin, he can be someone that can go forecheck aggressively, use his blazing speed because he's one of the fastest players in the league when he is playing. Hopefully he can come back soon, John. I think we both can say that just because of his eye issue. Yeah, Nick Benino, he was both an offensive good player and a defensive specialist was very good on face also the penguins numerous times during those runs mike sullivan would put benino out there for big time draws in the defensive zone heck if i actually recall correctly in game seven against the lightning he was the one that took the draw with 6.5 was yeah i think it was six, six, six seconds left Okay. to win the game, to send the Penguins to the final. Crosby, I believe, was on the ice at this time as well, but that's just how much Sullivan trusted Benino in that situation. And when you combine that also with Phil Kessel, who is an electric goal scorer still, you have the makings of a line that can just kick everyone's butt. And that's exactly what it did in both runs, especially 2016. Benino, very clutch player in the playoffs, eliminated the Washington Capitals in game six of that second round series in 2016. Also scored the game winner for the Penguins in game one of the Stanley Cup final against the San Jose Sharks. Had numerous other goals in the 2017 run to the Stanley Cup. That line in particular was just so good for them. Heck, there's a reason why Shawn Michaels was at game five of the Penns Lightning series. I know they lost that game, but the fact that they brought him there just goes show how much that line really just went around hockey. I mean, I'm trying to find a better way to say that. I guess went viral around hockey, if that's how you want to say it too. But it was one of the best lines in the league for a couple months. And all three players were a big part of it, especially Nick Benino. Yeah, it was cool to see Shawn Michaels get involved with that. And for anybody that, you know, might not be familiar with that name, Shawn Michaels, one of the greatest WWE superstars of all time and uh, was known as the Heartbreak Kid. So the HBK line, uh, Haglin, Bonino, Kessel, that, that's where that name comes from. And uh, he actually did end up going to uh, a couple of those uh, Penguin playoff games there. Um, and, you know, to, to your point, Hunter, they, they did lose the one that he was at, but um, he, he seemed to be having fun with it nevertheless. Um, and, and something else I wanted to ask you about here. Uh, and you've kind of already answered this, but Nick Bonino, you know, playoff style hockey, it just feels like it kind of fits his skill set where, you know, he is this gritty player and we know the intensity gets ratcheted up a whole bunch in the playoffs and uh, somebody that can go out there and, um, you know, again, not not like a prolific goal scorer, but you're not shocked when he comes up with a clutch goal. We've seen him do it in the past. Um, is he somebody that, you know, just in general, uh, his style just just fits playoff hockey? I mean, would, would you agree with that? 
I agree with that for sure. You know, he's he, he's also a very tough customer. He'll play through a lot of pain in the playoffs. He'll just give you these clutch moments. He did it so many times for the Penguins. Maybe not as much now for the Rangers, considering that he's just older and his offense has kind of left him a little bit. But hey, never say never. Maybe he does give them a clutch goal when the Rangers likely make the playoffs this upcoming season. And I did just want to correct myself a little bit. I believe it was between six to ten seconds left in that game seven against Lightning. I don't think it was six seconds exactly, but it was in that time frame. But yeah. yeah, I mean, again, like anytime you need him for a big draw in a big moment late in the third period, he will be there for that, especially in the playoff game. If you need him for potentially a clutch goal, if he can still do it, that would be huge as well. But yeah, I mean, he's he's a playoff style player. That's what he is. That's what he's always been. He's been a clutch player even before when he was, you know, a member of, for example, the Vancouver Canucks earlier in his career. I kind of look at it as, I guess, a better version of Jeff Carter in the playoffs. You know, Carter, when he came over to the Penguins, he was great in that 2021 series against the Islanders. I know the Penguins lost, but he was great. Showed that he was a clutch player. Last year against the Rangers, he played pretty well there too. I know they didn't make the playoffs this past year, and he's definitely trended down. But if you can get that kind of value in a series from Benino, the Rangers will be doing A-OK, I think, in a series. I would have to agree there. And uh, you know, another question about him, and you kind of hit on this too, but um, you know, going by you know everything that, what I know about Nick Bonino, you know, not watching him all that closely since he's never uh, been on the Rangers, but obviously I've seen him in the playoffs and whatnot. And um, one of the things that stands out is, you know, he's a good defensive forward. Is he somebody that, you know, say you're in a spot where, I don't know, there's a minute left and you're up by a goal. Do you want him on the ice? You know, first of all, taking the face off. And then secondly, just playing defense, defending, trying to do everything uh, that you can to hang on to that one goal lead in the, in the final seconds there. Yeah, again, even though he's not at 2016 level Nick Benino or 2017 level Nick Benino, he is still a player that you can put out there in a late game situation to win you faceoffs. He's still very good in the defensive zone. As we talked about, John ranked in the 84th percentile for defensive impact at five on five this past season at someone who is 35. I, Peter Laviolette, he likes to lean on veterans throughout his career. Sometimes he's a little bit eh with younger players, but I'm sure you know that can change at any point. But for someone who is big on veterans, I definitely think he's going to use Benito in that role when the Rangers are up a goal with maybe a minute left, 25, 30, 35 seconds. Any time during that final minute, I think he will definitely put him out there because, again, he's very good defensively. He can win you draws, good on the PK. So even though that's not a penalty kill situation, say six on five situation there, he can definitely get the job done. That's for sure. Yeah, for sure. And it's funny you mentioned Laviolette. You know, now that you say that, he just kind of seems like a Peter Laviolette type player. Yes. You know, what he brings to the rink. It just feels like that is a good uh, a good match there. And, I mean, who knows? You know, Drury obviously is the one making all the moves and everything. But I'd like to think that there's at least some communication there. And what do you think about Nick Bonino? And, and maybe Laviolette was on board with it. Um, who knows? Impossible to know everything that goes on behind the scenes. But, um, yeah, one more Bonino question. And then, Hunter, I figure we can turn our attention to just general fun Ranger Penguin offseason storylines and, you know, what we're excited about going into the season and all that fun stuff. But I'll let you go ahead and pick your favorite uh, Bonino moment as a member of the Penguins. I'm going to imagine it probably comes from that first run as opposed to this last run when he only played three games. But um, I figure it's got to either be game one against the Sharks in the finals where he scored with two or three minutes left, whatever it was to give them the lead. Or, and I think you're going to go with this, el eliminating the Capitals, excuse me, in overtime game six in the second round in whatever year that was. You would be correct. That yeah, winner against one. the Capitals in game six of the second round in 2016 is my favorite Nick Benino moment of all time. Remember, that game was absolutely crazy. The Penguins go up to a 3 nothing lead. It looks like it's basically over heading into the third period, but then the Penguins take all these delay of game penalties. They look stunned heading into the locker room for overtime. The fans are nervous, but Benino comes out there ends it in OT, sends the Penguins to the Eastern Conference Final. I'm only, I believe at that time I was, yeah, I was 18 at the time. I was going to turn 19 that year. And this was towards the end of my senior year in high school. I grew up, well, most of my childhood life in Northern Virginia, outside of Pittsburgh. And so I was surrounded by a lot of Washington Capitals fans. And all throughout the spring, you keep hearing, oh, we're still going to kick your butt, even though how good you were down the stretch, all that good stuff. But I was like, okay, we'll see. But when I went into school the next day, just wearing my jersey, just smiling at all the people who talk crap, it, it was the best, just seeing how mad they were. But just the moment overall, the goal call there was legendary, same 
with the game one game winner with against the Sharks when Benino scored with a few minutes left. That call was also amazing. But I do have to go with game six against the Capitals with how much it meant with just, just so important to and get the to, to the Stanley yeah. Cup. Yeah, I mean, and I know I was just speaking personally there with how much it meant for me just going in and talking a bunch of crap to Capitals fans, but <laughs> it electrified this city in a way that we honestly haven't seen since that run, to be honest, overall. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, I, it's cool hearing those stories. I mean, obviously, listen, I mean, we're we're not fans of each other's teams. I, I think that's probably fair to say, but it is just cool hearing, you know, hockey fans share their stories of, you know, who they were with and, and how they reacted and how it impacted them when, you know, this team, you know, scored in overtime to not to bring up bad memories, Hunter, but I actually did an episode last off season where it's honestly the easiest episode I've ever done. Cause all I did was I asked um, the loyal listeners of locked on Rangers to send me their stories of, of where they were and uh, how they reacted when Panarin scored in overtime in game seven. So I just sat there and read all those stories. You can check out that episode if you want to, I'm, I'm sure you want to, but uh no, no, it was a good time, man. But like I said, it really is cool to hear those stories. And um, yeah, you, you get a goal like that. You win a playoff series like that. And you don't forget, you know, where you were and, and how you felt when it happened. And, you know, those moments, um, you know, they're few and far between for a lot of teams. And obviously the Penguins, you've seen them win some Stanley Cups. So um, it, it's just cool to hear those stories for sure. I mean, I was watching with my stepdad. He's, he's a massive yeah. Capitals fan to this day, too. And I remember oh, when... Yeah. <laughs> the goal was scored at that exact moment. I, I I remember seeing him do this. He just face palms right in front yeah. of me. And I started my my mom is the reason why, you know, I grew up watching the penguins, why I do this show. I I she's everything to me with how great she is. And we were just celebrating so much, and he was just there almost in tears. He was just absolutely beside himself. <laughs> yeah, I was I was actually with my mom. Uh she was visiting um because uh, my daughter had just been born. I I trying to remember now, I guess that would have only been like a month. She's only a month or two old, but we're watching game seven together, Rangers and Penguins. And when that ended, like, I'd love to tell you, I was like screaming and like yelling, dancing around. I, we both just kind of collapsed and just, just like hugged each other. That was all it was. Like it wasn't years before that, when the Rangers beat the Capitals in game seven, that's when I went nuts and run around the whole house and everything. But this was just like, Oh my God, it's over. That series needed to end. We talked about that, how, you know, the fans from both sides were at each other's throats and, uh, just, just relief when it, when it finally did end. And of course it went into overtime, you know? Yeah. I mean, you know it, I know it, both fan bases know it. That series was absolutely ridiculous on so many levels and it yeah. really has just catapulted the rivalry very high. I would say right now, John, the Rangers might be the top rival of the Penguins and it didn't used to be that way for a several years. I would say the Capitals were up there along with the Flyers, but with how those rivalries have kind of gone downhill a little bit in recent years, I would say the Rangers have definitely taken that top spot, at least for right now, in my opinion. I feel the same way. And then there's Ranger fans that are kind of old school and they'll tell me, nah, man, it's it's always Rangers Islanders. Nothing will ever top that. And I'm like, look, I wasn't really around when the Islanders were winning all those Stanley Cups. So I don't see, like for me, the Islanders, like ever since I've been watching hockey, like they're not really much of a threat. I know a couple of like Eastern Conference finals appearances and somewhat recent history. But to me, man, it's Rangers Penguins. The Penguins have always been that team that, Man, we got to find a way to beat these guys. How do we stop Crosby? How do we stop Malkin? How do we stop Latang? How do we get over the hump here? And uh, yeah, man, it, it's just been a great rivalry over the past. However, I mean, if, it, it's really reignited recently, but really the last five, 10, 15 years, as, as far as you want to go back, it's it's been uh, just great hockey for sure. Oh, no, um, absolutely. And I, and I know, you know, again, you got the Flyers, the Capitals, the Islanders have always been a thorn in the Penguins' side. Every time something bad happens to the Penguins, it's usually because of the Islanders, though that rivalry, it's not as high as the Rangers. But again, right now, especially going into this season, those games are going to be must-watch, those Penns Rangers games. I agree. I agree. I'm, I'm I'm already looking forward to it and already getting excited just talking to you about this. But I figure we'll we'll keep everything rolling in just a second. I do want to ask you, Hunter, about a couple of the uh the Penguins offseason moves, I think maybe most notably the extension for Tristan Jerry, which was um, my understanding somewhat polarizing among Penguin fans. Uh, but we will get to that in just a second. All right. And so let's just go ahead and keep everything rolling here. Going to uh, continue our discussion with Hunter Hodes of Locked on Penguins, a special crossover episode here. And uh, just basically discuss the off seasons for both teams. And uh, Hunter, you know, obviously before this past season, Penguin shows some loyalty. They keep uh, Latang and Malkin, obviously the three cups there, uh, while they've been members of the Penguins. And the other big move that they made, uh, this off season is the extension of Tristan Jerry and Jerry, you know, he's been a good goalie for the Penguins, but he ends up getting 
five years, $5.375 million. And it feels to me, you know, just going by social media, and you'll know this better than me, but it feels like um, Penguin fans in general, and maybe even you yourself, Hunter, a little bit, you know, on the fence about this. You know, he's a good goalie, but is he worth that much? Just kind of give me a feel for, for how you felt about that extension, if you could. The biggest thing is it carries a, a lot of risk. Five years for someone who has not been able to stay healthy these past couple of seasons. It's a big one. It's a big gamble to take. But you said it, John, when Jari is healthy, I think he's one of the better goalies in the league. I personally think he's in that maybe 9 to 12 range of goalies yep. when he's healthy, you know, right Fiddling on that top 10 range, he's he wasn't 921 for no reason just a couple of seasons ago. He was very good during that 2021-2022 season. Actually, I mean, again, I mean, I'll keep saying this. I know Rangers fans will probably hate it. I think if Tristan Jari was healthy for that series, I think the Penguins win it. Yes, it's probably some copium for me. I get it. But I will continue to say that they probably win that series unless he just plays like he did against the Islanders, which, hey, that could happen. But I think he was on... What's the word I'm looking for here? Just a path to redeeming himself after that. But, you know, Anders Lee ran into his leg and you know, the rest was history after that. He didn't play until game seven this year. Battled numerous injuries. He says he's healthy now. He just has to go out and prove it. I think Kyle Dubas was getting a little bit nervous as the goalie started coming off the board in free agency. I don't really think he wanted to do a trade, even though there were quite a few good trade candidates out there, like someone like of the Melka. I wasn't too big on John Gibson, for example. I don't think his numbers are any good anymore, even though he plays on a bad team, but someone like of the Melka was good. He had Connor Hellebuck out there, UC Soros, but those were just big blockbuster additions that I don't really think they were going to do. But once you saw the goalie start to come off, I think Kyle was like, okay, I got to do something here. So he took the risk signed Jari, and we're going to see what he's made of throughout this contract. They are betting on him to stay healthy and to give them adequate goaltending. I'll keep saying it. If this team just gets average goaltending, I think they're a playoff team this season. And that's how it's been throughout the tenures of Sidney Crosby, Evgeny Malkin, and Crystal Tang. Just get average goaltending, and the team should be fine. The big question will be who plays instead of Jari during games. You still have Casey Smith on the team. They signed Alex and Delkovich. They signed a couple other goalies. It's going to be really, really interesting to see, excuse me, what happens with that rotation when Jari is not playing. But those are really my main thoughts on it overall. Yeah, for sure. And, um, you know, another uh, free agent pickup for the Penguins. This is actually somebody going into free agency. You know, I did a couple episodes where I'm spotlighting a couple of different players and you know, what do the Rangers need? Who can they afford? And a name that I came up with was actually Nola Chari. Um, again, just kind of a gritty, a little bit like Bonino, you know, just kind of a gritty uh, defensive forward, uh, somebody that, you know, goes out there, plays every shift very hard. And the Penguins end up signing him three years at $2 million a pop. Uh, I would say even with Achari, maybe some somewhat underrated, you know, offensive skill as well. Not not a superstar, but he'll get you some points. And um, I, I thought he would have been a great fit for the Rangers, but he ends up going to the Penguins. Um, how do you feel uh, about that signing, Nola Achari to the Penguins? I think he's going to give them like a Brandon Tanev type game yeah. for each game this upcoming season. If I said that weird, I apologize, but I think he's going to be more of that Tanev replacement that McGinn was not when he was a penguin. And just because, you know, he's a very physical player, he'll definitely lay the body, but he's also very good defensively ranked in the 90th percentile five on five this past season. When it comes to defensive impacts, also very good on the PK ranked in the 87th percentile. It's funny, John, you can ask me that same question about Matt Nieto and Lars Eller, and I would have the same question, I would have the same answer I would have for you right now about them, except that I don't think they're going to be brain and Tanev type replacements. I think Achari is going to because he's just going to be a lot of fun to watch. He can lay the boom good defensively. I think of those three, he will give the Penguins the most offense. I'm actually more bullish on him, maybe 12, 13, maybe upwards of 14 goals with Nieto and Eller. I think it's going to be a bit less than that, but with Achari, I like the fit. He can play, you know, either wing spawn. He can play center if you need him to. But honestly, the theme for all of the bottom six signings for the Penguins was just getting better defensively in their own zone because the Penguins were horrendous in their own zone this past season. The bottom six in general was an absolute tire fire. When the top six was on the ice, they were A, not scoring, and B, letting in a lot of goals in their net. I understand the plan. It's a bit risky because the top six is going to have to be really healthy. But if the bottom six can just pull their weight 
and not allow as many goals as last year's unit did, I'm going to be, I think, a bit more bullish on the team heading into this season than I originally was maybe on July 1 where I was like, mm, I'm not really, don't think it's going to move the needle that much. But hey, you know, there's still a little bit of time where it's the first or second day of August here. There's still a little bit of time heading into training camp. But overall, I do like the Achari signing. And I think of the players that Kyle Dubas brought in to help out the four group, I think he's going to be the best one. Yeah, I would I would agree with that. You know, just kind of looking at everything the Penguins have done between trades and free agency and whatnot. And, um, I figure, you know, Hunter, we, we can pretty much call it there. I mean, it's uh, it's been fun as always doing this uh, this crossover edition. I was going to ask you, John, what do you yeah, think yeah, of yeah. all the, the Rangers moves this offseason? They bring in Nick Benino, uh, Tyler yeah. Pitlick, Blake Wheeler. That was the big one coming over from Winnipeg after they bought him out. Jonathan Quick is the new backup to Shesterkin. How bullish are you on the Rangers heading into the year? No, I feel good. I mean, you got the core back in place. You know, they didn't lose anybody of, uh, of I mean, I mean, of course you lost the rentals, but you knew that was going to happen. You knew Tarasenko in all likelihood wasn't going to be back. Uh, Tyler Mott is still out there, although at this point it seems like he might be playing somewhere else next season. And Patrick Kane, I mean, I don't expect him to sign with anybody anytime soon. Um, as far as, you know, what they did in free agency, yeah, overall I thought it was good. I mean, you got to create grade on a little bit of a curve because – you know, they didn't have a ton of cap space. There's not a whole lot of maneuverability. So you're looking at a situation where, you know, you'll sign a sixth defenseman. And they did that with Eric Gustafson, who I, I think that's, you know, a solid signing for your sixth defenseman. Uh, you need a new backup goalie. You get a legend in Jonathan Quick. I realize he's not prime Jonathan Quick, but uh, I, I think, you know, him being in a clear-cut backup role could be good for him. And also, the Rangers have a, a goalie coach who's been there forever, Benoit Lair, And obviously... You know, his his two most notable success stories are clearly Lundqvist and Shesterkin. But even guys like Ranta and like Cam Talbot when he was there and, uh, you know, Yaroslav Halak had a nice season last year as the backup. All these guys pretty much swear by him. It seems like they always benefit uh, from working with him. And look, Jonathan Quick obviously knows his stuff, but I do I'm interested to see what happens here because now this this goalie coach, this goalie guru uh, has a situation where. You know, it's kind of a reclamation project. He's not helping somebody early in his career. He's trying to get somebody somewhat back on track. And I think Quick with less wear and tear could be a good backup. And the big one for me was Blake Wheeler. And, um, you know, quick story, Hunter. So I'm doing a live show for, for the start of NHL free agency. I'm thinking this could be fun, you know. And, and that was the day, if you remember, that Twitter was all wonky and, and nothing was working right. And you're yep. over your tweet limit or whatever that was. And nothing's loading. And I'm like trying to watch NHL Network and look at social media. And people in the chat are telling me, oh, we got Blake Wheeler. I'm like, wow, because I, I didn't think the Rangers could afford him. Um, I like the fit, but I didn't think they could afford him. And people are telling me Blake Wheeler for 800 k And I'm like, you guys better not be messing with me, you know? And I, I realized, you know, Wheeler, not in his prime anymore. He's going to be 37 before the season starts. But to get somebody like that at a position right wing, which is probably your biggest weakness, and to get him at just a shade over the league minimum – I mean, I, I get that he's older again, but I don't see how anyone can be upset about that. He even last year in what was, you know, one of his uh, not great seasons compared to what he did early in his career, he ended up with like 53 or 55 points. You know, it was a solid season. And now uh, to play in the middle six on the Rangers, you know, I think it's a good landing spot for him. And I think the Rangers are going to benefit from having him uh, in the fold next season. Yeah, I mean, I don't think he can skate as well anymore. That's for right. sure. I think that's mm -hmm. part of his game has definitely gone down a little bit, but I think he'll still be good for what at least 15, 17 goals, probably more than that at this point. And, he, and maybe he even scores 20 to 22 goals on, in a third line role. But curious to see how that goes. But I mean, I still have the Rangers as a playoff team heading into this season. I don't think they're just going to fall off pretty hard or anything like that. I just, I'm curious to see because I have the top two teams in the Metro as Carolina and New Jersey. That's just me personally. But after that, I have the Rangers, then the Penguins and Islanders, obviously. I think those spots, those three to five spots in general, are going to be highly contested this upcoming season in general. Yeah, the Metro is always crazy. And right when you think you know what's going to happen next or, uh, you know, this team is on the rise or oh, this team isn't any good at all, you know, the whole thing gets gets flipped around. I mean, I know the Canes tend to – they've won it the last couple of years in a row. And obviously the Penguins for so many years were in the playoffs and uh, they could be back in the mix. And, you know, the Rangers and Devils have really reemerged the last couple of seasons here. It's it's crazy, man, you know, and, and who's to say what's going to happen this upcoming season? Maybe the Blue Jackets surprise everybody and they're right in the – you never know. You never know, right? So uh, it, it's definitely – it's a fun division to watch. And honestly, man, you put any two of those teams in that division together and put them on the rink together and you're going to be entertained more often than not. I agree. I think it's 
in my opinion, the most competitive division heading into the season. You could, I could see right now, six teams out of there being in a playoff spot or just may, potentially making the playoffs, not being in a playoff spot, obviously, since, you know, the max can be five, five, three, at least from the two divisions. But I could see as many as six being involved in getting a playoff spot. And heck, you're right, John, maybe the Blue Jackets make it seven because I think the Flyers are probably going to be the worst team in that division this upcoming season with their rebuild. But the Jackets, hey, maybe they do surprise us and Johnny Goudreau goes off and you know the additions they made, the, the, the draft they had. I'll, I'll be curious to see how they do, especially also with Mike Babcock as their head coach now. Yeah, you just never know. I mean, there's always a couple of surprises and a couple of disappointments every season. And uh, man, I, I just can't wait. It was great talking hockey with you here, Hunter. And um, I don't know about you, man, but I'm just so excited for this upcoming season. Obviously, neither one of our teams ended up where they wanted to be this past year. And I think in a lot of ways, uh, whether it's you and me or um, just fans of the team in general, I think that makes you look forward to the next season just that much more. And I, I, I think I can speak for both of us when I say we are definitely looking forward to this next season. These two months can't go by soon enough, I think yeah. is how I want to end this show. It's that August, we are truly now in the dog days of summer. The arbitration's finishing up. You're not going to see many trades, maybe outside of, I don't know, Connor Hellebuck, Noah Hannafin. They have the whole Eric Carlson situation to deal with at some point. But there's just not a lot of action right now, and the league likes it that way. So hopefully these next two months speed by pretty quick. I'm with you there. And uh, listen, Ranger fans, Penguin fans, thank you guys as always for tuning in. And um, Hunter, man, if you want to do this during uh, the regular season, we got some matchups. We'll do you know a pregame show here, a postgame show there, whatever you want to do. I'm up for it as long as you are. Yeah, that sounds good. And Pat will be there for this one. He has a work thing come up. My new co-host, Patrick Gamp, but he will be back for the next episode on Friday and moving forward. But we will definitely have a new face for those crossovers as well. Uh, looking forward to that. Looking forward to meeting Pat and, and talking hockey with both of you guys. So, uh, yeah, once again, Ranger fans, Penguin fan, fans, thank you as always for tuning in. And uh, we will see you guys next time.